the video is amplified. So if you miss anything, you can go home and work. And Renee's going to, I'm going to go ahead and start. And if Renee gets something going, we'll just pause, right? We're not on TV here, so I think we're okay. <laughs> Well, you guys, I just want to start by saying well done getting a, a diligent study of the book of Job. You guys are awesome. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Woo! That was, that was some serious Bible study, right? That was not like uh, tea time, you know? That was like, let's go to the depths of what it means to know God and trust him. And way to go. Just have to say that. And Today we're starting our last study of the year, if you can believe it. We've already been through three books now, and today we're going to start looking at the book of 1 Peter. And I just wanted to ask you guys a question. If you guys have ever been in a situation where you felt like a foreigner, I know in 2005, I got to go to um, Senegal, West Africa. Looking back, it's like, I was insane. I went all by myself to help with this little missionary conference, leading some worship for that. And when I got off the plane after a very long flight, the people that were supposed to meet me weren't there. And I remember looking out, maybe like a thousand people, and there wasn't one white face like mine. I was a foreigner. There um, was very little English being spoken. And that's a very unsettling feeling. Like, even if you feel safe, it's just very unsettling to be a foreigner. Um, especially when a new home that you might be in might be hostile and actually want to hurt you, right? Okay, let's try another microphone. Thanks. Let's try that. Oh, that sounds really good. I like that. Well, Peter wrote this letter to a group of Christians that were foreigners. That's where we're going with that. And um, they were suffering because of their commitment to following Jesus. And here's a quote. If anyone understood persecution, did I put that on? Okay, there we go. If anybody understood persecution, it was definitely Peter. He had been beaten, he'd been threatened, he'd been punished and jailed for preaching God's word. He knew what it took to endure without bitterness, without losing hope, continuing to live an obedient, victorious life. And this knowledge of this living hope in Jesus was his message. And Christ's example was the one to follow. So we're going to see our central idea for today as we look into this book is that Peter encourages us to live victoriously in a hostile culture. And Chuck Swindoll had an interesting idea. He said first Peter might be called the Job of the New Testament. What do you think of that? Oh no. <laughs> yes. In that it provided encouragement for the true believer to continue it on in the way that Jesus has laid out for all his followers. The endurance Peter called these believers to is similar to Job's, a man who suffered despite his righteousness. Peter maintained that this was the kind of true perseverance that God expects from his people. So we're starting a new book, and whenever you approach a new book of the Bible, we've been saying there are always some questions we should ask. What are some questions we should ask? Let me hear it. What should we ask when we're starting to study a new book of the Bible? Who wrote it? Who wrote it? When did they write it? When did they write it? Who's it to? Who's it to? Excellent. When? When did they write it? Yes, very good. Uh, you know, another question is where does it fit in the Bible? You know, where does it fit in God's story, God's great story of the world? Purpose. Purpose. There you go, like a key verse. And very interesting you should say that. <laughs> because we're, we're very blessed in this book where it's very nice when an author just says, this is my purpose. And Peter did that in 1 Peter 5.12. And there are many um, theme verses but I thought this would be a great key verse. 1 Peter 5, 12, Peter just says, my purpose in writing is to encourage you and to assure you that what you're experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. 
There it is. That's his purpose for us. That's his purpose for our reading and studying this book. So I want to challenge you guys in the next week, you're going to do, you're going to read the commentary for today, and then you're going to start lesson two. But before you do that, read the whole book. Or better yet, just stick it on, listen to it. You can do it in one sitting, it's five chapters, but let's try to get a sense of the whole message. At one point, Peter casually mentions that he's written briefly to us. I thought, wow, if this is brief. Um, I guess there are, letter to the Hebrews would be more, less brief, but, but it is brief, it's five chapters. And so we can read it as a whole and get to know this book. So today, this is how we're going to talk about things. We're going to start out looking at the author, the recipients, then we'll look at the location and the date it was written, and then we're just going to spend the rest of our time talking about who was Peter. And we're going to see that Peter encourages us to live victoriously in a hostile culture. So Peter starts out giving us a clue. This letter's from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So this was Peter's first inspired letter to other believers. And many early church fathers confirm his authorship. There's lots of early and strong support for Peter being the author of this book. One mystery, though, is that it's written in excellent literary Greek, which is a little bit mysterious for a humble fisherman to have such a command of Greek. But again, Peter gives us a clue to this. In 1 Peter 5.12, he says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. So Silas, many feel, served as a scribe, which many times people would, uh, would ask a scribe to help compose documents if they didn't have quite the language facility to do so. Silas also could have been the one to take this letter, this message, to the readers. And what's interesting, we're going to see 2 Peter, which we're going to study after this, has much rougher Greek. So many think, okay, he wrote that himself. Maybe Silas was, was occupied. He couldn't grab him. So we're going to see that. So the Greek, it, you know, which we can't appreciate reading a translation. But just know that he wrote this with the help of Silas. So to whom is the letter addressed? Another great question. Who are the recipients? 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Chosen followers of Jesus who were foreigners and pilgrims. They were people sojourning in a strange place away from their own people. And the idea behind this word pilgrims is someone who lives as a temporary resident in a foreign land. Um, maybe pilgrims live in that constant awareness that this isn't their true home. That's who he was writing to. In the back of your Bible study book, you're going to see this beautiful map is back there. And you can see where these places are that he mentions. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And as I was staring at this, I just got the chills because you know what that is right now. This is modern day Turkey. I thought, oh my word, all of the world's focus right now is on this, this catastrophe. And you know, I just was asking God, why this week? You know, would we be starting to study this letter to Christians in this very region that were suffering hardship and persecution? I got a letter from an organization talking about the church in Turkey right now and how they're just struggling to be a resource for children that are left orphaned. It's just a monumental task. This, much like today, Christians were suffering in this region. So Peter called them aliens, indicating he wasn't just speaking necessarily to Jews or just to Gentiles, but to all Christians who were living their way, their lives in such a way that they would have stood out, right? And if you're an alien, you kind of stand out from the surrounding culture. And this letter, this group of letters at the end of the New Testament is what's called a general epistle. It's not written to a specific group or church family. 
Remember, Paul wrote many letters to specific churches, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Corinthians. But I love that this letter was written to unnamed believers living in a hostile culture. And that makes that so much more accessible even to us 2,000 years later as we follow Jesus in our increasingly hostile culture, yes. So in, in a very real sense, we are recipients of this letter too. So the location and date that it was written is important to know. First Peter 5.13, Peter says, Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings. Babylon, was he in the actual city named Babylon? Peter sent greetings from that church, calling it Babylon, but it's most likely he was using a metaphor. He was used the name of that ancient Mesopotamian city as a stand-in for Rome. Most likely he was in that modern city like Babylon that had given itself over to idol worship, false gods, and tradition, church history tells us that Peter spent his final years serving the church in Rome. So where does this letter fit in the bigger story of the Bible? And I never want to assume that y'all have all spent your whole lives around the Bible. So remember, we have the Old Testament in the Bible, which was the story of the establishment of the Jewish nation before the coming of Christ. And then the New Testament starts out with the Gospels, the stories of when Jesus was here on the earth. And then the book of Acts starts with the resurrection and return to heaven of Jesus and the formation of the early church. Now, this early church started in Jerusalem, but spread out across the whole region because of these waves of persecution. And many churches were founded in that map, that area of, of Asia Minor. Many churches were founded here. And we know that this letter was written around A.D. 64-65 because it was written during the reign of Nero. There he is. There's the madman. And, and shortly... Before A.D. 64, Nero famously burned down Rome. He burned it to make room for his building projects. And when the Roman citizens heard this, they were so upset. Their whole lives had been wiped out, and they threatened a revolt against Nero. So he needed a scapegoat. So he blamed the Christians, the followers of the way, followers of Jesus, and this set off a vicious persecution throughout all the Roman Empire. So many Roman Christians fled to these other areas, and the Christians that were already from those areas were also subject to persecution. So we know that Nero's, came, Nero's time came to an end in 68. So it had to be written, this letter, before then, because we know that Peter was killed during Nero's reign. So this is the craziness that Peter and these early Christians were living through. And that's why Peter encouraged us and them to live victoriously in this hostile culture. So you have to ask, who was Peter? Who was this author? How does Peter describe himself? Right in that very first verse, he says he's an apostle. And the word apostle means one who is sent. It's also translated as a missionary. He was a leader among the apostles. He's, his name's always at the head of the list of the 12 first apostles that Jesus named. We have more information about Peter in the Gospels than any person other than Jesus. He lived with Jesus for three years. No one speaks as often as Peter, and Jesus speaks more to Peter than any other individual. So when we first meet Peter, he's Simon the fisherman. And his brother, Andrew, brings him to see Jesus. And they become part of that first group of 12 disciples or students of the rabbi Jesus. John 1.42 says, Andrew, he brought him to Jesus. 
And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which translated is Peter, which when translated means the rock. Cephas and Peter are both words that mean rock. So Jesus looks at Peter, it says, you're Simon, but you will be a rock. And it's ironic because at first, Peter is not a rock, okay? He, is, he has a long process, you know, much like our lives. Peter is a fully formed character. You know, my daughter-in-law is an actress, and she always is very critical of movies where, where, story, where characters don't have a story arc. They don't learn and grow and change. Well, we have this in, in Peter throughout the pages of Scripture. We have lots of backstory on Peter that we could look at. Um, it's a long story, but I'm going to choose just to look today at three vignettes of the life of Peter. And there are Peter's confession in Matthew, his denial in Luke, and then his restoration in John 21. And this is what I want to do. I just want to read some of these pictures to you guys, and I'd love for you guys just to close your eyes. I didn't put the scriptures up on screen because I just want you guys just to listen and invite Holy Spirit to bring, bring the story to life. Just put yourself in these scenes and try to picture it. I'm just going to read these three passages to you guys. If you want to just shut your eyes and listen, that would be great. So Matthew 26. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Then in Luke, so they arrested him and they led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. Peter joined him. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. And finally she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. Then about an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them. He's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Then in John 21 later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. So at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, we'll throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus said. Now come, have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And after breakfast, 
Jesus said, ask Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And Jesus told him, follow me. So those three little scenes give us a picture of some, a part of the life of Peter, of his story arc. He was weak. He was flawed and sinful. But he's very relatable when you say, time and again, Jesus failed to meet his expectations. You know what that's like? But he learned who Jesus was by walking with him. When Jesus gave a hard teaching and all many of the people were deserting him, in Matthew 16, Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you guys say I am? He asked his disciples. And Simon was the one who answered. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So in this moment, when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus doesn't say, you will be the rock, right? Now he says, you are the rock, and I'm going to build my church on you. But the story wasn't over. Right after this, Jesus starts saying, okay, I'm going to die. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be killed. And Peter says, no, 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 that is not how it works. That's not what Messiah does. So Jesus rebuked him again, said, get behind me, Satan. Jesus rebuked Peter more than any other disciple. And Peter was the only one who ever dared to try to rebuke Jesus. He was kind of like us, Peter. We think we know who Jesus is. You see, Peter thought Messiah was going to rule and reign and conquer and overthrow the Romans. Um, but as he walked with him, he learned differently. At the triumphal entry when Jesus entered Jerusalem the week before his crucifixion, Peter must have thought, now it's going to happen. Here we go, guys. We're going to overthrow the Romans. But right then, Jesus took them, all of the disciples, up into this upper room, and he did a very strange thing. In John 13, Jesus started washing their feet. And golly, to Peter, this was really bad. This is not what Messiah did. In fact, there was a rule at the time. The way disciples were treating their rabbis was getting out of hand. They were being abused. So there was actually a rule at the time that a disciple of a rabbi was not allowed to wash the rabbi's feet because that was work for slaves. So here is Jesus, the rabbi, washing the disciples' feet. And Peter must have been profoundly confused. And Jesus came to him and he said, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. So Peter's like, okay, well, then wash my whole body then. <laughs> like, we just sense this confusion in, in Peter. He argued, I'm not going to deny you. I have your back. And then he failed. And some say that Peter's denial of Jesus was rooted in fear, that he was afraid but, you know, I don't think that's true because, you know, Peter was the only one that actually followed Jesus after his arrest. Peter was the one who attacked, drew his sword, and was ready to fight, to attack. His denials, I think, were rooted in despair. 
just despair and confusion. The Messiah he expected had, would have servants washing his feet. The Messiah he expected would draw his own sword. And even up to the morning of the resurrection, when Peter and John were at the tomb and they saw the grave clothes folded up, it says, Peter went away wondering what had happened. He still was struggling. He was still confused. And so Peter needed this special moment of restoration from the Messiah in John 16. Jesus built a fire and invited him to come to breakfast. And he gave Peter a chance to reconfirm his love three times, imperfect though it was. He says, do you love me, Peter, more than these, more than jobs, families, a comfortable life? And you know, Peter's like so many of us with our good intentions and our epic failures. And you know, Jesus longs to restore us too. I think Jesus is building that fire and inviting me to breakfast every morning. He is there. He's inviting us into that intimate time with him, giving us a chance to say yes once again, into, and to be a part of that great adventure of feeding his sheep, of serving and seeing his kingdom come. So we can bring Jesus our hurts and our failures, and we can let Jesus restore us. So after the resurrection and ascension, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he became the leading gospel preacher, the leader of the early church. And he even did many radical miracles. In Acts 2, he confidently preaches, and thousands are saved. And then he's called to carry the hope of Jesus beyond the borders of Jerusalem. For the rest of his life, Peter encourages us to live victoriously in a hostile culture. And we know from history that he died in Rome. Like James and Paul, he was killed for his faith. Tradition says he had to watch his wife crucified first. And that his last words to her were, remember Jesus. And I'm sh maybe you've heard when they came to him, his turn to be crucified. He requested that he not be killed the same way as his Savior Jesus was. So they crucified him upside down. And he died near Rome just about two years after he wrote this letter. So 1 Peter 1 says, I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces. And I'm wondering, how do followers of Jesus live obedient to God as foreigners? How do we participate and shape our society? How do we have a healthy respect for it while maintaining appropriate separation from it? We love it, we care for it, but we're separate from it. And all this is inevitably going to bring us suffering. And Peter's readers had fled this persecution to, fall to these foreign places. And how about us? You know, if we're followers of God here in Conejo Valley, in many ways we too are foreigners in our growingly hostile culture. You know, maybe your story sounds something like 1 Peter 4. It said, You've had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. You know, maybe you're slandered among your family. Maybe you're slandered among your neighbors. If you used to live like pagans, now they think you've gone insane. We're different because we have a different set of priorities. We're living under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is our king. And we long to see renewal and redemption in our world. And we have this unexplainable peace and joy. So my question, our challenge for today is, how can followers of Jesus live victoriously in our hostile culture? And, you know, I guess my first question is, am I living differently? 
Am I so easily absorbed into my culture that there isn't any difference? That's a really good question to ask. And the best way to see someone's values are to look at your calendar and your checking account. That's going to tell what you value. How are we spending our time and our resources? Are we serving God or consumerism? Do we abstain from soul-killing sin? First Peter, we're going to see several practical ways that we can live differently. Our attitude to secular government, an employee's attitude to the boss, suffering without retaliation. We're going to dig into how women can make themselves beautiful. That's going to be fun. And then how men can honor women and their wives. If we truly live as foreigners in this Ventura County, we might not always fit in. True? Yeah. So in this study, we're going to look about how to engage culture and actually change and shape it. Tim Keller argues that Christians can't not be involved in shaping our culture. By working in the world, Christians will either assimilate into their culture and support the status quo, or they will be agents of change. Isn't that cool? It sounds like a TV show, Agents of Change. <laughs> CBS, more Park Simi Valley. Sometimes we'll be called to preach and fight for justice and kingdom values. Sometimes we're called to work and live in peace with those around us. But maybe the biggest way that we stand out in our families' neighborhoods is that we have a living hope. Hope. Isn't that a good word for our times right now? We face struggles without losing hope or becoming bitter. We trust God in hardship, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And I want us to get a little head start on our memory verse because it's a good one. This is what we're going to learn this week. Let's, let's read it out loud together, okay? 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How, how are we born into this living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus. When we come to him in repentance, our old self dies, and the same power that rose Jesus from the dead brings new life and hope for us, for all eternity, and also for right now, for right here in Moore Park, Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks. Because of this hope, Peter's purpose in writing is that we can stand strong in the grace of God, living victoriously in a hostile culture. It's going to be a great study, and I'm so excited you guys are here. Let's pray. God, we, we look to you for wisdom, how to stand strong and live differently, how to be those agents of change in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our circles of influence. God, thank you for the living hope that you offer us through the resurrection of Jesus. God, our heart's desire is to shine that, to share that hope with everyone we see, Lord, would there be many, many lives impacted by all of us in this room because of that living hope that we bring wherever we go. We are the presence of Jesus in a hurting world, God. May we shine brightly. We look forward to all that you're going to teach us in this study, and we thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys.